Good afternoon, everyone. This is Elaine Groman on Earth Wisdom Circles on Empower Radio. And as you may know, the focus of this show is to bring individuals to the airways that are really making a difference in our world. And certainly we are in a huge time of change and we need all those that are well, willing, ready, and able to make a difference in the way we think and the way we behave and the way we are with one another. And my guest today, Peter Samuelson, is one such individual who has had such an illustrious career of not only film, but of philanthropy and compassion in ways that really need to be emulated in our world. So I'm going to let Peter do a lot of his own introduction. So welcome to the show, Peter Samuelson. Thank you so much, Elaine. So Peter has been for many, many years involved in the film industry and has been the producer of the Return of the Pink Panther, the Revenge of the Nerds, and many, many, many other films has been involved in originally from England, immigrated to the United States and lives in Los Angeles with his wife and has raised four children. Don't know about grandchildren yet, but probably so. <laughs> and four, three? three Good. Three. Good. I have six. I can appreciate how wonderful that is. So tell us about you, Peter. Tell us about you. So uh, I'm a product of um, education and then of the American dream. And I've been eternally grateful and trying to help others uh, achieve those two things um, ever since they were gifted to me. The first uh, pivot for me was that in high school back in London, my English teacher in 10th grade, Mr. Lund, I'm sure he had a first name, but we weren't allowed to know it. He was just, <laughs> or maybe maybe his first name was Mr. I don't know. You never know. Anyway, <laughs> Mr. Lund said, see me after school, which is never a good thing. Uh, and he said to me now, look here, Samuelson, if you work about twice as hard and if I help you, you could get into a really good university. And I laughed in his face. And I said, Mr. Lund, I don't think so. My people don't go to university. In fact, my dad left school at 14. And no, I don't think so. He said, wow, well, if nobody in your whole family has ever been to university or college, then that'll be even better because you'll be the first one. So that was my first pivot because he did help me and I did work twice as hard and I got myself a full ride to Cambridge and I got my bachelor's and I got my master's and then the American dream happened for me, which was that um, I had been working as an interpreter, a French English interpreter for an American uh, film production company mm -hmm. and the producer said to me, would you like to come back to Los Angeles and see how we edit a film? And I said, I would, um, you know, single man. And um, I said, where is your office? He said, it's on Hollywood and Vine. And I said, oh, I've, I've even heard of that. So I came to America. And okay. after a number of years, I thought, you know, this is now too boring to have half my clothes in London and half my clothes in Los Angeles. And I should really choose here, where where, where do I belong? And I realized that um, the ties that bound me uh, were in Los Angeles. And so I got my green card and then eventually I got my citizenship. And I thought when I went down to be sworn in that it would be you know just a formality thing and you read off a laminated card and they say here's your citizenship it wasn't it was an incredibly moving i think people born in america don't realize how great is the american dream what does it mean it means you know what's written on the statue of liberty on the base give us your huddled masses and what it really says is we don't care about your parents so much what we care about is you we will, if you come to America, we will get you a really good education. And if you're any good, you will rise like cream on the milk 
And you too, regardless of whether you brought any money with you or as in my case, none, um, you will be able to make your fortune here. You will be able to achieve things. And that is the American dream. And as I now look at America, I think most people born in America have kind of forgotten what um, its value is to the country. What it really says is the greatest of all commodities gets imported, which is brains. And those brains then propel people to a level of social significance where they are taxpayers, where they are consumers, where they raise hopefully healthy families, where their kids go to college. And by applying education to this sort of raw material, we've built America for hundreds of years. America was built on immigration and it's free brains from around the world. And people want to come here because they're yearning to breathe free, again, from the base of the Statue of Liberty. And that applied to me. So one way you can look at my life is ever since I got here, I've been trying to pay back on the American dream by delivering the American dream to young people uh, who wouldn't otherwise be able to access it. For example, foster kids, you know, nothing the matter with the kids, everything the matter with the grown-ups. apply education. 87% of our kids, our first star scholars, get into college and go on and build professional, successful lives and raise healthy families and become part of the American dream. Um, that's what I believe in. And they don't have, you know, a British dream or a French dream or a German dream or a Japanese dream. There's an American dream. And we are beyond any other country, a country built out of empowering immigrants to pay back and then encouraging them to do so. And I think we turn our back on that at our peril. I think that you're so right, Peter. Thank you for that beautiful explanation of yourself because the thing that I, when I had the pleasure of meeting you, although it was briefly, I was so touched when you spoke and you didn't elaborate on your own accomplishments, although there are many. You elaborated as you just did. You spoke about the need to encourage others, especially children, to find their dream, to find their, their tribe of people if you will, that helps them to believe in themselves through the ups and the downs of life, through the growing pains of life, through the challenges that we all have. And some have extraordinary challenges that many of us will never face. And as you say, you know, when we, when we help to recognize it's the children in foster care that are at the problem, it's the adults, but we, are, we're, we have to recognize we're raising adults. And so when we have these young people become adults, then they won't, they won't replicate the challenges that they themselves have lived, hopefully. Yes. Let's, you mentioned tribes. Let's mm -hmm. talk about tribes for a moment and tribalism. Yes, please. Yes. And, you know, and walls and things that divide us up into little compartments of the like and um, – create fear and loathing of people who are not like. I, um, a few years ago, um, my wife and I took the family on a vacation to Perigord in France, known for good food and its cave system. So they've got caves there that date from before the Stone Age. And the remarkable thing about the caves is they were first inhabited by Neanderthals and then after the Neanderthals died out, the entrances of the caves got sort of covered up with, with soil. And then they were reopened by Homo sapiens, you know, 10, 15,000 years later, and they reoccupied them. So you go in this cave system and, you know, yes, there's, you know, pictograms on the walls and it's, it's all very interesting. It's also scary as all heck. It's cold, it's very dark, and you can absolutely walk in the shoes or the bare feet of Stone Age man. 
average life expectancy 25 years in the Stone Age. You're in a cave that's only about four foot six ceiling height. You don't eat on most days. You are in a perpetual state of hunger. The only thing that you can rely on is the other people in the cave whom you know well. They are your little tribe, your little family, and there is a leader. And the leader says to you, those other people out there, the ones who we glimpse who live on the other side of the valley and they dress differently and they look different, um, they are the source of all our problems. They're after our food, they're after our water, they're after our animals, they're after our women, and um, we don't need to be scared of them because we hate them. And what I, what I realize is that hatred is fear dressed up in a more palatable way. And I realize that, you know, we, we invented farming and we stopped being hunter-gatherers and we cave, came out of the caves. But I guess Samuelson's law of caves is you can take the men and the women and the children out of the caves, but it's much more difficult to take the caves out of the men and women and children because we carry with us, I think, genetically, but also encouraged by some pretty malign um, top-down leadership, we carry with us a propensity to fear and therefore to hate anything and anyone that's different. Who are these people? They're taking our jobs. Make them go away. You know, they're, they're, they're troublesome. I, I'm, I, I don't want them anywhere near my family. They, they, they should leave us alone. Let's push back on them. Let's build a bloody great wall and we'll keep them all out. And actually, it's not true. What is truth is that the people on the other side of the valley or the people on the other side of the ocean, they are scared of and they also have hopes and dreams that are identical to ours. Uh, they would like food. They would like their children to get an education. They would like someone not to be persecuting them, not to be chasing them, not to be killing them. They also are scared of plagues and diseases and coronaviruses and sudden death and the unexpected. And they're just as scared of us as we from time to time are scared of them. And we need to not live in the Stone Age. We need to get our brains out of fear as the driver for our attitude to the other 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. And we need to realize that the planet is incredibly small. Remember the um, Apollo mission when it, it swooped low over the moon and it, it, there's a famous picture called Earthrise and it's Googleable. And um, mm -hmm. it, there it is, it's like the gray moon is below us, just a few miles below the capsule. But in the distance, is this little blue marble thing, and that's the Earth. And it, it looks kind of tiny, and you look at it and you think, wow, so all 7.7 .7 billion people live on that little blue marble. Seriously, we're going to kill each other? We're going to let, you know, fascistic, fear-based leadership tell us that what defines us is what separates us from everybody else? It's ridiculous. The, the, the blue marble is hanging there um, in the sky over the moon, and, and, and it looks about an inch and a half across. And all these modern-day awfulnesses that afflict us, disproportionately, they victimize all of us together. Right. Um, you know, famine, pestilence, coronaviruses, nuclear proliferation, Poverty, change, so many things. Poverty. Yeah. Um, come on, you know, mass migration. Um, the history of the world is mass migration. People have moved around our earth. Everyone on this earth pretty much um, uh, is from somewhere else. 
you know, f f focus our minds, if we may, on the fact that every single living human is directly, linearly, genetically descended from a single woman who lived in Northeast Africa 120,000 years ago. We all share that mother, that ancestor. We are all descended from her. We all, every single one of us, including everyone who hates somebody else, both of the haters share the genetic inheritance of that woman. So come on, let's apply knowledge, science, truth, critical thinking, investigation. Let's start from a position of trying to understand and walk in the shoes of other. And let's see where that gets us. Because if you look back on the recent hundred year history of the world, the most awful thing that has happened is that technology has empowered hatred to threaten existentially the whole damn planet. You know, yes. you apply nuclear proliferation to otherness and you have something really combustible. You, you, you apply mechanized warfare, tanks and bombs and explosions to people who hate another group because they look different and you suddenly have the First World War, the Second World War, this war, that war, the other war, and millions and millions of people die, and we ought to be able to apply critical thinking and not to repeat, you know, was it Santayana who said those who forget the lessons of history, uh, the errors of history are doomed to repeat them? Well, he was right. And I'll tell you where I read that quote. It's engraved on a boulder at the entrance of the Dachau concentration camp. And I found myself there in, in Munich and I thought, I've got eight hours before my return flight. My business took you know, much less time than I had thought. So I took myself off in a cab uh, to, to Dachau and spent you know, four hours walking around in the rain in February and just mind boggled that in one sense, the brilliance of mankind, the ability to organize, um, uh, to, to achieve, goals bigger than any one person could had been applied in a completely evil way to the business of mass murder based on a hatred that had no rational basis whatsoever because they were killing children, for example, and babies, you know, who were just born. So what the hell did they do to anybody? Right. Um, Hatred based on physical appearance, on religion, on mm -hmm. ethnicity, on belief, it's unworthy of us. That's right. We you must know, do Yeah, it's the two things I want to comment about, and I speak about and write about this often, is we don't realize how our language directs our thinking and how we follow that line in a very uh, singular way. So religion in particular espouses beliefs, but the moment you have a belief and you uphold that belief, you don't have to think. So you do so many things based upon that. And I think we have to understand that religion and the, the term religion from the French word religare means to control. So we need to understand our own language and how we're manipulated by language so that we can actually learn how to think. We can actually learn how to be inclusive and make choices. And, yes. and our beautiful Mother Earth, as you spoke of, is birthing continuously everything we need. So we are un, un, unequivocally and impossible for us to be disconnected from this living Earth. The very, yes. the very water that our body is created in, in, in the amniotic fluid, knows us better than we know us. You know, this incredible miracle of our body, this intelligent thing that somehow has its own brain and knows what to do without our volitious thought. 
So there's so much more going on that we need to expand because we have never had the experience as, as you work so tirelessly to do, Peter, is to bring this awareness of our own human growth and our own human potential. That we really need to have literally the waters parted so that we can birth ourselves in a new way. And we can bring the reality of what we have yet to tap fully, which is our human intellect, our human imagination, our human heart, our human compassion, and how one by one that can nullify, hopefully, or at least minimize the anguish that we all feel that we don't understand where it's really coming from. Sure. I, um, I find myself paradoxically increasingly optimistic mm -hmm. that we're going to dig our way out of the awfulness that surrounds yes. us and imbues our lives. Uh, I, I hope you read in the New York Times over the weekend, it is the first time in general planetary human history that um, population growth appears to be stopping and that mm -hmm. there is going to be some diminishment of the world's population. Population is falling in so many different countries. It's growing in Africa, true, but it's falling in China, in North America and in Europe uh, and in other parts of Asia. Um, so I don't know why that is, but, you know, we've gone back to apparently a, a two-person unitary family um, has to average 2.2 children in order to have steady state of population. And that's now diminished as low as 1.5 in so many different countries around the world. So that's one thing because so many things that we've done to despoil the planet, Mother Earth, um, are actually helped by less people. Yes. Uh, it's not without its problems because the pyramid of humans has always been a larger number of young people paying into society in order to support a, a smaller number of older people. That pyramid is now upside down or at least is turning upside down. So we have to be economically very careful here to make sure that we have sustainable systems. But if you look at something like climate change, you know, awful, terrible, murderous, though the coronavirus has been, it basically froze human society for a year and a half. And I think Mother Earth has benefited from mm -hmm. the lessening of po pollution, the lessening of burning, you know, hydrocarbons from the Earth's mantle and on and on and on and on. Um, it, it, it created a pause, a hiatus, and we'll see now whether we can come back better or whether we just go back to the same bad habits that were pulling Mother Earth down, um, you know, into a hole. Yes, and if we're wise, we look and notice and really observe how in that pause of a year and a half, how Mother Earth was able to rectify so many things, to yes. remove pollution, to clean water, to do so many things that she has been doing for millions and millions of years. So let's, Peter, let's talk about the work that you're doing with the film co program that you have. Could you explain that? And the, I think it is so beautiful and it touched me so deeply when I realized that, you know, as, as I was reading and studying again about what you do, is how you're helping to change the way the film industry is being more responsible. Can you speak to that, please? So there's a man called Jonathan Prince. Um, he's a close friend and he's my partner in the company called Filmco. Significantly, it's spelled P-H-I-L-M-C-O. So it's filmcomedia.com, filmcomedia.com. So he and I have been discussing this idea for years and then with inauspicious timing, uh, we started the company just before uh, the coronavirus hit, um, but we've made a really great go of it. We've raised a ton of money. We're raising more. Uh, we have extraordinary projects. The premise of the company is, you know, the, 
the great writer Richard Powers said, um, you'll never change a person's mind with ideas. The only thing that can do that, change their mind, is a great story. Yes. And what Jonathan and I have realized is that if you create a great film, a great television show, uh, a great series, you generate empathy in the heart and the soul of your audience, and it has a limited shelf life. Someone goes to a theater and sees a two-hour film and their heart is moved, it then dissipates that feeling of empathy in their heart by the time they've gone out and got into the car and gone home and walked the dog and taken out the trash, they have forgotten the moment of empathy. So the premise of Filmco is that we will, far from forgetting the empathy, we will amplify it and that in that moment of empathy, we will provide a kind of a la carte menu of things that someone in the audience whose heart was moved can do to help the cause that is embedded in the subject of the film. So how does that work in practice? Well, everything that we develop is intended to be, and hopefully will be, a successful motion picture or film for streaming or series for television it has to be commercial because what commercial means is um, you achieve an audience. Um, the audience pays for the experience of watching your material directly or indirectly, and you therefore can pay your investors back. And that means they'll reinvest and you have a sustainable, viable commercial company. But there's a second bottom line, a dual purpose. And the other one is that we only make projects, audiovisual projects, whether they're fiction um, or whether they are documentary, whether they're short form or long form, motion pictures, television, streaming, whatever it may be, series, we only embark on it if we can answer the question, if this is successful, how will it make, how will this project make the world a better place? Hmm. What that leads to is, first of all, rejecting a whole lot of projects, which are purely distractive entertainment. Nothing the matter with that. I've done a bunch of it myself. Uh, nothing particularly socially redeeming in uh, The Return of the Pink Panther or Revenge of the Nerds. But we don't make those kind of films. We make all genres, but we want each film to serve two masters in parallel. One is pay back the investors make a sustainable company, make a commercial film. But the other is make the world a better place. So from the get-go, we reach out to nonprofits, to 501c3s, and we say, hello, we're making a, a film and we could use advice and you are the world experts in organ transplants and the challenges of getting people to sign up to be organ donors. You are the American Cancer Society. You know everything about cancer. We're making a series called The Cancer Chronicles. Will you please come in and work with us? And how it'll work is you'll have a piece of our profits. In return, you will make sure we get the story right. We've had some amazing experiences. We sat with our writers on a project called In a Heartbeat that we're making. So this is a very commercial action adventure film about an ordinary man who's given an impossible task, which is to deliver a parcel against all odds, against a ticking clock. And we come to understand that he is actually a doctor and in the ice cooler on strapped to the passenger seat next to him in the automobile, driving through a storm and getting mixed up in a drug ring bust gone wrong um, is a child's heart. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't deliver it to the second hospital by 10 o'clock tonight, a little girl will die. So there we are sitting with the expert nonprofit whose goal is to get people to check the box on their driver's license, sign up as an organ donor online, whatever the state system is where you live. And, um, the lady said 
to our writer, I do um, have one other suggestion beyond, you know, getting the technology right and the technique right, the science right, and I can help you with that for sure. But could you please make the donor family African-American? And we said, yes, of course we can. There's absolutely no reason why not. Terrific. Consider it done. But wh why, may we ask? And the lady from the transplant charity said, well, because the history of doubt in the black community mm -hmm. is fueled by a hundred and something years of mistreatment of the African-American community by the medical profession, by medical researchers, by the medical establishment, you know, the Tuskegee experiments and on and on and on. They they tend not, you know, we have a, it's 16 percent of the population. We have terrible difficulty getting African-American people to agree to be heart donors because they kind of are dubious of the medical profession. It's the other side of the same coin of, um, you know, getting vaccinated. So we said, well, consider it done. So what a brilliant thing this is that when the film comes out, we're going to scrutinize the adherence to sign ups for organ donor status. What a fantastic thing it would be if there was a spike as a result of the film. And we can measure that. And what an yes. unbelievable honor it would be to save some lives in the period after that because um, organs were available, were donated and saved some other little girl's life. And if we move that needle in society, so we work with the nonprofit all the way through the film that I made last year that's called Foster Boy, which is about a child victimized by for profit foster care. Um, mm. Our goals are to stop foster care agencies being run for profit, let the government run them or let them be run by a charity. But they shouldn't be making a buck on the heads of children. Secondly, in half of the states of the United States, when children go to court, they don't get their own lawyer. We think that's absurd. We give everybody a lawyer when they go to court. You know, convicted felons get a lawyer. Um, why wouldn't foster kids always and without exception get their own client allegiant lawyer? So that's a second goal. And then raising awareness of what is PTSD? How does PTSD, which these kids have through no fault of their own, they haven't done anything wrong, but they were abused or neglected, and then they're institutionalized and they're moved around like cardboard boxes from often, too often, one loveless placement to another. And then um, the outcomes are very poor. Less than 9% of American foster kids go to college. That's madness because what college does is it gives you a second chance. You may have had a rotten family upbringing and you've been institutionalized and you've been that cardboard box. But if you can get your bachelor's, if you can get your master's, you can really be someone. You can have your American dream. So um, that film has very measurable goals. It's out now. It's all over iTunes and Fandango and Amazon Prime. It's called Foster Boy. The website's fosterboy.com. We you. have a double bottom line. Pay back the investors, then they'll reinvest. What a good thing. That means lots of people see the film. But our second goal is for sure that we would like to, you know, have a look at fixfostercare.org. It's a petition. I hope everybody listening and watching here will sign the petition. I, I'm a big capitalist. I believe in capitalism. I don't believe, and I don't believe anyone should agree with making money with incentives for social workers. The more kids they can cram into a placement, it should always be the child's best interests and that's not right. commercial interests. So that's an example of a film that I've actually made where we actually have the social activation campaign going on right now have a look, fixfostercare.org, and you could even sign the petition. Thank you. We, I certainly will. And uh, aside from this, what you're also doing is you're expanding the reach as you're talking about the foster children and, and the, the criminal enterprise, really, it can be, is at the expense of these children. And you have gone a step further when you created the First, first Star 
organization in which, please explain that, in which you help children get the education that they so desperately need and want. So um, back in, I guess, 2010, uh, 11, 12 years ago, um, I, I read an appalling statistic. In America, 45% of American 12th graders go to some kind of college or university. But foster kids in America, and there are almost half a million of them at any one time, foster kids, it's only 9% who go to college. Mm. And that seemed to me to be perverse because if you go to college, as happened with me, first in my family, various good things happen. Number one, you can't be homeless. Half of all American foster kids end up homeless, indigent, on welfare, criminalized within a couple of years of aging out of foster care. That's terrible for society, and obviously it's terrible for them. How much better if we could get them into college? And so I, I started asking myself, how would we do that? What do you need in order to go to college? If you have no family, you have you know, no encouragement at all to further yourself through education. How do we do it? So uh, I got myself a meeting with um, Chancellor Jean Block, who's the chancellor of UCLA now as then. And I went into his office and I said, Chancellor, I would like to propose that you allow me and my nonprofit to house, educate and encourage high school aged foster kids in the middle of your campus. And he said, well, how old would they be? And I said, they would come to us 13 and a half or 14 years old, rising ninth graders. We would have them for four years. And our singular goal at the end of 12th grade would be that they graduate from high school and that they go to college, university, or some other highly worthwhile career. Mm -hmm. And I came out of his office, one of these genius meetings. Sometimes you meet someone who has soul in their intellect and intellect in their soul. And at the end of two hours, he said, well, I think we just have to do this. We'll pilot it. He said, do you think, you, do you think we can raise the money? And I said, I think it's one of the most powerful ideas. All young people seek to emulate, not you, not me, we're too old. Young people, 14 to 18 years old, want to emulate slightly older young people who are 22, 23. What do you have at a university? That's exactly who you have. You have high achieving. You have kids from every walk of life. You have many, especially at a public university like UCLA, you have many kids who are first in family to go to college. Those are the role models. We'll hire them to be the, the RAs, the residential advisors, mm -hmm. the, the youth coaches, the tutors, and we'll hire a staff. I said, I think it's a compelling idea. How can we fail to raise the money to pilot this here at this great university? And he said, right, let's do it. We'll put a committee together. We'll do it. So that was, I suppose, beginning of 2011. And with some trepidation, 2012, so, you know, roughly a decade ago, we actually did it. We um, went to uh, CPS for Los Angeles, the Department of Children and Family Services for LA County. And we said, hello, we would like to interview, please, 100 um, eighth graders. Um, we really had no clue what to look for. We knew we shouldn't look at their grades because foster kids, some of them have been in 12 placements, 15 placements. They've attended a dozen schools. How would you ever get any grades? It's a miracle you can write your name at the top right-hand corner of the paper. So we, um, we had them write a little essay. Remember, only eighth graders. Please imagine that it is your 100th birthday party and your best friend, who's known you your whole life, makes a toast. What would you like them to be able to say about you at age 100? Oh, man. We, lo we looked for any spark of anything going on, um, anger, frustration, 
Why do I have to be the one in this rotten foster care situation? I, 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 I dream of stuff. I, 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 I want to better myself. I, I'm interested in nanotechnology. I dance. I sing. I, I've always been interested in architecture, but I don't know anybody who is an architect. And we recruited 15 boys and 15 girls or young men and young women. And we just sort of started that summer of 2011. And about two weeks in, we looked at each other, we, the staff, and we said, this is like watching flowers open. Turns out there's nothing the matter with these kids. Yep, a little bit of carried PTSD. So we do individual therapy. We do group therapy. What do you have at a university? <coughs> oh, you have a department of psychiatry. You have psychologists, you have social workers. Oh, you need a math tutor? We have a mathematics department. And it became a kind of, when they gave us the Icon Award two, three years later, I said to the vice chancellor, um, thank you so much. This is really magnificent. They got the mayor to give it to us. Um, I said, why have you given it to us? And he said, because it's just about the only thing on campus where everybody volunteers. Most of our philanthropy, and it's extensive, it's either faculty or it's administrators or it's grad students or it's undergraduates or it's staff. But this first star academy thing, it's kind of everybody. And the embarrassment throughout has been, you need a math tutor, you have 27 people who volunteer to be a math tutor. And you have to tell, you know, 25 of them, thank you so much, maybe next year, but we, we only need two. Um, we, we're so oversubscribed in the volunteering. So the snapshot now is we have 17 thriving academies across the United States. We've sort of, you know, why would you only open one Starbucks? Uh, you want lots of Starbucks. If people like the coffee, you should build them all over the place. Um, so we've, we've, we've got to 17 in the United States and we have three in the United Kingdom. So that makes 20. But listen to the best statistic. So you heard me say 45% of all American 12th graders go to college or university. But for foster kids across America, 9%. But that's not true of first star kids. Our 12th graders, 87% of them go on to colleges and universities. Mm. So it's 10 times the benchmark. And we've sustained that now for the last six years across the country. So it is a dramatic, straightforward, you know, implementing it is not straightforward. How do we keep the kids safe? And, you know, who supervises them? And how do we do this? And what's the blend of curriculum? And you know, you, they've got to be able to ace the SAT or the ACT, but you've got to do life skills because they've been raised by wolves and they don't know the difference between a debit card and a credit card. And we've got to teach them about sex ed and this and that and the other. And then the third element of curriculum is it doesn't really have a name. I think of it as love, love expanded. It means you belong here. This is your family. These are your brothers and sisters. Mm. This, is, this is your people. It's a ladder. If you fall off the ladder, don't worry. We will put you back on the ladder. But in the end, you are the only one who move your feet up the ladder. And where the ladder is going is to the American dream, a healthy, productive, tax-paying, consuming, raise. A, a, a family, be a professional, have a vocation, do something which makes you happy and so that you jump out of bed and think, what a privilege I get to go and do this work. Not a McJob, but mm. a vocation. And it, it really, really works. So that's that's firststar.org, F-I-R-S-T, S-T-A-R dot org. And you're looking at a picture there if you're on the visual part. And there is Shaquille O'Neal who came in and um, we, we made him an executive producer on Foster Boy. Uh, he did the voiceover for the little explainer 
animated video. We, we thought we've got to get these statistics of foster care across because they're compelling, but they're boring as well. So we thought, right, Shaquille O'Neal, the voiceover, a little two minute animatic, um, uh, little animated uh, video. So he did that and he's been helping First Star and Foster Kids ever since because he's someone who, you know, grew up poor um, and has been, now that he's such a successful thought leader, you know, he's got his doctorate, he's highly educated and he's been, what's that saying? A man never stands so tall as when he reaches down to hold the hand of a child in need and Shaq has been doing that ever since. Isn't that beautiful? So again, my guest is Peter Samuelson. Peter, what is the best way for people to reach out to you and to your organization? Is there a preferential contact that you have? Yes. Um, you know, time is the great Satan, um, but I do my level best not to go to bed until I've answered everybody. I'm mm -hmm. constantly mentoring, you know, a dozen young people. Um, I just have to sort of the old line is, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. I do my level best, and sure. I've now got sort of acolytes who help me a lot. I couldn't have done anything. I mean, my my five nonprofits, each of them has hundreds or thousands of volunteers and highly trained, um, you know, staff professionals. I couldn't have done any of it. You know, we've raised, if you add everything up, we've raised over a billion dollars for these nonprofits over the last 30 years. Um, but it's the result of the efforts of, you know, many hands make light work. Um, I'm reachable, it doesn't really matter. You can Google me, Peter Samuelson, S-A-M-U-E-L-S-O-N. There's abundant ways to find me there. Or you can email me, um, for example, peter at um, edar.org, E-D-A-R.org. That's one of my nonprofits. That's the one where we um, give away single-user homeless shelters. I, I got with a couple of others, I got this patent on a $600 four-wheel device, which in the daytime you push it around, put your kit in it, and do your recycling and whatever. And then at night, you unfold the front, you unfold the back, and you now have a seven-foot-long cot uh, in a, uh, 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 a, a um, uh, canvas um, surrounding with four windows and a door, and uh, they're 600 bucks. So peter at edar.org. Everyone deserves a roof. So peter at edar.org will definitely find me, but so will the other ways. I have too many email addresses, but they all go to me. So good, good. I'd love well, you to know, it. the other day I, I wrote a post on Facebook and, and it's about exactly what we're talking about is that empathy is the witnessing of suffering but compassion is doing something about it. And I think that what you are doing in all, all of the many avenues that you have in film and in, this, in the universities and in your nonprofits, you're taking action. You're, you're looking at the need. Anyone can look at a need, but so many people look at a need and pretend they don't see it. And when we take that part of ourselves, that heart that we are so needing to understand what compassion actually is. It's not something to be afraid of. It is so inclusive because we all need it. Yes. We're all capable of it. All yes. we have to do is decide to step in that direction, as you say, to, to raise yourself up to the next rung, not to be above people, but to be able to see the need, to be able to see what you have not seen. Yes. And I Ahead, I, I, I think um, we do too little entrepreneurship in the pro-social space. We say to our MBAs that their purpose in becoming an entrepreneur is to make as much money as possible uh, by, you know, furnishing an answer to some consumer need. There's nothing the matter with that at all, but that same um, the, the, the tricks, the toolkit of entrepreneurship need to be applied to our biggest social challenges. Example, um, 
many of the things I've done start with a moment of empathy. Um, I decided I was scared of homeless people, you know, a big guy, uh, maybe who doesn't smell so good and who's kind of in your face uh, with handout. And I was ashamed of myself that I felt that way because I clearly intellectually realized, rationally realized, these people have got nothing. So why am I intimidated? So it wasn't good enough. So I challenged myself to do what became over 60 interviews. And I would go out on the weekend on my bicycle with a clipboard and I would ask two broad groups of questions of some unhoused uh, person that I found. Uh, I asked them, how do you get money and where do you sleep at night? And the epiphany, the moment of empathy for me was there was this old lady on Santa Monica Boulevard at the F San Diego freeway. And I said, where do you sleep at night, my dear? And she said, come, I will show you. And she took me by the sleeve and led me onto the Caltrans scrap land by the freeway. And there was a humongous cardboard box with a piece of blue plastic over the top. And it was disgusting. It smelled bad and it had been raining and it was just awful. And I remember she had put her stuff outside to dry in the sun. Um, but the epiphany was I looked at the box and on the side of it, it said sub-zero, and I thought, oh, my God, I have the refrigerator, and this old lady has the box. Oh and my. we are going, each of us, to sleep at night, what, three miles apart, four miles apart? What is the matter with this picture? What's broken here? Clearly, something. So yes. I, did, I did a lot of research, and I thought, right, I'll just build a shelter. So I got a Costa, I got an architect, uh, we did a budget and we worked out to build a hundred bed dormitory shelter was about $5 million, buy the land, build the building, kit it out. If you divide 5 million by a hundred, that's $50,000 for each bed that you generate. Then I found out that there were at least 60,000 unhoused people in LA County so do the math, 50,000 times 60,000, that's $3 billion. I have no idea how you raise $3 billion. So one of the things about being an entrepreneur, you don't give up. Um, so I thought, all right, well, that isn't viable. We'll never put a dent in the problem, you know, by building our way out of it. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. So I thought, I wonder what would be the best we could do with 600 bucks per unit. Um, surely we could do something better than a damp cardboard box on a rainy night off of the freeway. So I tried to design this thing. Uh, and it didn't have a name initially, and I couldn't design it because I have the spatial design ability of a newt. I couldn't draw it, <laughs> and I could hardly describe it. So I took myself off to the Pasadena Art Center College of Design where I met with Dean Korshek and I said, if I put up a little bit of money, could we have a competition of all of your design students and they can build, you know, cardboard maquettes, one tenth scale. And he said, of course we can do that. So we had the competition. And then I started working with um, the, the winners. And in fact, Eric Lindemann, one of the two winners is still working with EDAR right now. We got a, prototyping metal shop. We went through 10 prototypes. Uh, I raised a bit of money. We ordered 50 of them. Uh, we, we, we studied efficacy. We did focus groups. Uh, and then we ordered 300. And then we got some more money. And right now, we're rolling out our Mark II, the result of making improvements to it. And it is on a scale of 10. If 10 is a nice, you know, fluffy duvet, uh, in a nice apartment somewhere. Uh, and if zero is the cardboard box or just lie down on the sidewalk, well, this is no better than a five. And on the day that the city fathers and mothers decide that they're going to house a large proportion of the unhoused, 
then God bless. We will gather up all of the EDARs. We'll, we'll, you know, squash them with a road roller and we'll melt them down and we can all join hands and dance in a circle. I don't believe it will ever happen in our lifetime. But that's an example of entrepreneurship and not just mine, but, you know, the rest of my board. And I've got some astonishingly clever people on the board where we just took this one little idea and we actually did it. And when we had reversals, we got past them. And I'd also say one other thing to anyone listening who has a checkbook or a credit card or a debit card. Um, this is the time to look at the fact that our wealthy and our ultra wealthy are wealthier as a result of the tax cuts of, you know, the last four years. Everybody up there, not not the people, you know, on the breadline, not the unhoused, they've got less money than they had or none. But those who are upper middle class and who are wealthy um, have more money. And this is the time to be kind of the new Medici. Who were the Medici? They were a textiles family in Italy before the Renaissance. What was their gift to the world? They invented the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. They forced cross collaborations between experts, multidisciplinary thinking. They kept their people safe. They were their patrons. They sent them off to the new world to explore where they didn't just send merchants. They sent merchants with sculptors, with painters, with botanists, with doctors, with scientists of every stripe. And they would sit there and have lunch, breakfast and dinner on the way over on the ship. And then they would do the same thing on the way back to Europe. And the result was a flourishing of knowledge based on science and truth and intuition and doing the right thing and empathy. Mm -hmm. That was the Medici. The gift and the ability of affluent people now is to say, you know, I do have a bit of spare cash. I could help the entrepreneurs who are engineering a better world, raising my hand immodestly on my couple, three, five things, um, we could use a little help. And well, it'll hopefully we'll get some with this. Peter, I hate to cut you off, but we we're running out of time. And I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you're doing, for the example that you're showing other entrepreneurs, other people in the film industry, other philanthropists to open your heart and look at the challenges we have and we can together we can find solutions all we have to do is want to and move in that direction thank you so much peter this is elaine groman on earth wisdom circles and empower radio my guest has been peter samuelson please look at the many things that he, do, he has done and continues to do it's up to each of us to make a difference in our lives after all that is why we have been born to make a difference thank you thank you elaine Thank you.